Good evening and welcome to Micro Live. Tonight we look at the new amendment to the Copyright Act and ask, is this sort of thing making us a nation of criminals? And I'll be looking at the way computer dealers learn their sales talk, while our American reporter Freff looks at how computers are helping to sell a corporate image. <laughs> Do you ever wonder whether computer dealers actually know what they're talking about? I was in a well-known high street computer store last week and I overheard a woman being sold a Commodore Plus 4 home micro under the impression she was actually buying the much more popular Commodore 64. Well, that's a bad enough mistake for a home user, but imagine being sold the wrong system for your business. In the end, of course, it's all down to the dealers. So how do the better dealers stay in touch with what's new? There's a major computer event happening in this hotel, but it's one you may never have heard of. What's the markup? Well, we supply you from £10 a unit, and our recommended retail price is £50. One of our little £50. technical £50. people sat in with a very gloomy look on his face said, all we need is a name like Pink Software. Where's the catch? No catch. There's got to be a catch. This is the computing industry, for God's sake. This is Soft Teach. Two days in which computer product manufacturers display their wares. But not to the general public. This event is only for dealers. Many of the companies here were showing products which were brand new, like this version of the integrated package Open Access from SPI. <laughs> this is iOmega's mass storage system for PCs. It's called the Bernoulli Box. Inside the cartridge, there's a floppy disk, but when spun, it has all the properties of a hard disk. It's capable of storing up to 10 megabytes, but unlike a real hard disk, it's rugged and portable. Artificial intelligence is an area that's gathering an awful lot of concern right now from magazines you can't pick up. A MDBS were pushing what they claimed was the first useful artificial intelligence package for business and making extravagant predictions about the future. And we're finding that certain people are suggesting that by 1988, sales will be over $2 billion. People are suggesting that by the end of the decade, sales will be over $4 billion. Now, that's more than what we're seeing in database or spreadsheet or word processing or productivity tools combined. Their product is called Guru. It's what's known as an expert system shell. One of their demonstration programs is a farming expert. By asking questions about factors like date of planting and pest problems, it can advise on the best course of action. So is soft teach just an excuse for some more hard sell? No, not at all. This is a training forum. This is where the dealers come in and they have an opportunity to spend 45 minutes with each vendor. And uh, the whole point is that they learn how to sell the product, features and benefits. It's not a show. This is intensive, uh, very serious training. Welcome to Soft Teach. How many of you happened to see our last presentation six months ago? Oh, that's a good number. Do you remember Andre, kind of the stout guy that came here before, showed a picture of his family? Yeah. Yeah. I brought a picture of my family, too. As you can see, he had remembered... One of the most popular presentations, Satellite Software, promoting WordPerfect, their word processing package. Okay, we think you'll agree. WordPerfect 4.1 is now going to be the most perfect WordPerfect ever. This new version sells with over 80 new features, such as an improved spell checker. There's even a thesaurus if you're stuck for words. And something unusual. It also allows you to word process with the text in columns. As you can see, this is a picture of our competitors when they saw a list of features in 4.1. It's going to be a very nice release. We hope you and your customers enjoy the product. We know you're going to make a lot of money with it. We know your customers are going to like you for it. At least the Word Perfect presentation had some light-hearted moments. Two days full of 45-minute seminars is exhausting. Despite the lure of free T-shirts, calculators and pens, it was perhaps surprising to find dealers there at all. Their reputation for understanding the products they sell is very poor. 
45 minutes is not enough to become an expert. But by golly, these guys are saying to you, by coming here, I want to be expert. I want to be able to help you, Mr. Customer, in, uh, in running your company more effectively. A dramatic approach was used by One to One, one of several competing electronic mail services. Hello! Telecom Gold are the market leaders. Uh, we're the last into the market. I would estimate we're in second place now. Um, Telecom Gold, without being too rude, take the attitude, well, we're out there. You catch us up if you can, and why should we join you? Cynthia, where the hell are you? I've had Jenkins on the phone four times already, and Robertson called... Cynthia, don't cry. You had an upsetting experience driving to work. I did warn you about buying that C5. <laughs> Electronic mail has got tremendous potential. Um, it just... I don't think it'll be realised until all the services have an interconnection. One-to-one uh, -one is willing to do this. I wish the other service operations were just as willing. All right. <laughs> I'll expect you when I see you. That's all I need. No secretary for the day. One-to-one I... -one electronic mail, Mr. Rimboard. Rambo. Looking at soft teach, you'd think everything in the computer industry was rosy. So whatever happened to the recession? Well, I'm not sure that recession is the right word. Oh, uh, since 1980 to maybe last year or recently, uh, if you didn't talk 60 and 70 percent growth rates in the microcomputer industry, every, everybody thought you failed. But go to another industry and uh, talk about 5 percent growth rates over a year and everybody will give you a prize. So let's just scrub recession and call growth not quite as much as it was a few years back. So the good people will continue to survive and continue to run good profitable businesses. This is a new adventure game called Fairlight from software house The Edge. Like most software nowadays, it has various forms of protection to prevent it being copied and to stop anyone listing it to discover the programming secrets. But in this month's copy of your Spectrum magazine, there are details of how to break through some of that protection. By using various pokes, it's then possible to increase your lives, to carry more goodies and so on. Well, I've been joined by Dr Tim Langdell, Managing Director of The Edge and Chairman of the Guild of Software Houses. Uh, Tim, does it worry you that that kind of information is being published? Well, in this particular case, no, for a couple of reasons. One, what they've printed doesn't actually help the reader to make a copy of Fairlight, which is a major concern. And two, they've actually gone and hacked into a version of Fairlight which there's very few copies in the marketplace, so some other pokes are needed for virtually every Fairlight uh, that anyone might have. It's a totally different version. They've got it wrong. Yes, they've got a very early version that... Nobody else has I gone. See. But to be clear now, you don't object to people hacking in just for the fun of it? Quite, yes. Right. Well, Tim is also on the board of FAST, the Federation Against Software Theft. Well, I'm actually surprised you've got time to come on the programme, Tim. And that was instrumental in getting this amendment to the 1956 Copyright Act passed by Parliament. It came into force on September the 16th this year, and now, for the first time, software has the same protection against piracy as music or literature. Uh, Tim, before I ask you about the act in detail, are you happy with it? Well, obviously we're extremely happy that uh, copyright in respect of computer software is now recognised. And we're not 100% uh, happy with the act. There is a reform, I believe, going through within a year. And there are a few changes we'd like to see then. Right, let's get absolutely clear about this. What is now illegal? Well, making a copy uh, of a piece of software is uh, an infringement of, of copyright. Uh, is, unless the publisher actually says that uh, you are permitted to make a copy, it is an infringement. Any copy, for any reason, is illegal? Essentially, yes. Technically, and that's now true. Now, Tim, for years we have been told it's common sense to make a security backup for your own private use. Is that now illegal? You're telling me it is. Well, we have to draw a distinction between uh, a civil, uh, legal problem, civil and legal problems. What the Act has given us the power to do, and what we're primarily interested in, is where people are making copies for commercial gain, either swapping them, selling them or whatever. We can now take very serious action in those cases. But are you going to be taking action in the case of somebody making a single backup copy for himself? I would be very surprised if people uh, in the publishing community are concerned about people making true backups. It's when they give the backup to a friend, 
uh, or give away the original copy and use the backup that we're, we're concerned. So nobody is going to be prosecuted for a backup? Is that what you're telling me? I would be surprised, but I obviously can't speak for the whole industry. Right, well, let's move on to what I'm sure most people would think is illegal, and you certainly do, and that is the case of children who swap in the playground. Now, what is going to happen to them under the new legislation? Well, anyone who actually starts swapping programs, uh, copies of programs or sells them to friends or indeed sells them commercially, their advertisements in the back of newspapers and so on, advertising uh, that these are for sale, uh, they are liable to have action taken against them now. And will you prosecute a 12-year-old? I think we've got to very seriously look at any case. We would uh, be approaching the school, the headmaster, if it's taking place in the school. Um, as for specific cases, I, I don't think I'd be fair to judge on, on that. You're not going to tell me whether, you're, in fact, you will prosecute? It's, it's very difficult to make a statement. It's... Insofar as it is wrong now to, to copy software, maybe, but I, I just don't know. Right. Well, let's come on to something which I demonstrated a few weeks ago, which is this unit here. It's the beta disk drive, which enables you to put uh, software which is on tape onto a disk if you've got a spectrum. Is this now an illegal thing to use? Well, that's a very good question. Um, there's not a simple answer at this moment. My view, personally, is that where a product like that is used to make a disk copy, where you couldn't otherwise make a, a disk copy, there isn't a disk copy in existence, um, then it seems a fair enough device. But where it is used to make a disk copy and then you give the original to a friend or it, it makes copies which you then give away or sell, that is infringement of copyright. Right. Can I ask you just to sum up then, why should nobody ever copy software in 20 seconds? Well, quite simply, uh, if we could cut down copying I seriously think we could see a higher quality of product, we could see cheaper products in the marketplace. I think it would be benefit to um, people who buy software. Right, Tim. Well, that's all we've got time for now, but I'm sure this is an issue we're going to be coming back to. If you've got any views, please write in and let us know. But meanwhile, Tim Langdell, thank you very much. Thank you. The Labour Party unveiled its plans for information technology in a major policy document this week. The shadow industry spokesman, John Smith, says Labour has a nine-point plan which will provide markets, finance and skills needed to develop the IT industry. The document emphasises the need for companies and unions to work together and says there should be a national training strategy developed. Just over an hour ago, Britain's leading professional computer exhibition, Compec, closed at London's Olympia. Underneath the exhibition gloss, there was a nervousness among manufacturers anxious about the current slump. Some of the big names, Microsoft, Apricot, Lotus, decided to stay away. The industry is going through the worst depression it's ever known. However, that didn't stop some exhibitors launching new products. Like this system, which can freeze a frame from a video camera. It converts the grey levels into colour and prints out the result. The printer uses inkjet technology and can reproduce 36 colours. In fact, printers were much in evidence at the show, with prices dropping as performance improves. One clear trend to emerge is printers offering a choice of fonts, like this latest from a Japanese manufacturer. It wasn't only hardware and software that was on offer. High-paid jobs were being promoted too. The exhibition is sponsored by Computer Weekly, which this week publishes a recruitment supplement aimed at the elusive skilled worker. For the first time, there are half a dozen recruitment companies exhibiting at Compec. Their presence at the show reflects the increasing shortage of skilled people in the computer industry. How the industry meets the demand for these skilled staff is one of the major crises it faces. And finally, from Japan, the latest in memory, a plastic card with built-in chips. They have a claimed storage of up to a megabyte, are difficult to pirate, and this one contains a prototype pocket version of WordStar. Nine thirty in the morning, and an executive bus ferries prospective corporate customers from the local airport. They're buying for their own organizations, not for themselves, and the company they're visiting is saying, buy from me, not from the opposition. To do this, they've designed a kind of technological Aladdin's cave. I sometimes think that in America, selling is as necessary to existence as breathing. 
People just don't believe things until they're sold on them. And if you're a big company, you've got to sell them in a very big way. Here in Grand Rapids, Michigan, one of America's largest corporations has built what they call a living laboratory, although what's actually being tested might be the technology of the big cell itself. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Westinghouse Thank Furniture you. Systems. Hi, I'm Shirley I'm Cheryl, Thompson. I'm Cheryl Edwards. Cheryl, nice to meet Thank you. you. Blaze Key. Blaze, I recognize you from your pictures. Thank Rick you. Martin. Hello, Rick. Good to have you here. Thank you for coming. We're going to be going this way to the customer center, so if you'd like to step around the corner. Oh, okay. Thank, Thank you. you. From the moment they arrive, every potential customer also gets a personalized electronic welcome. All over the building, computerized message boards like these are lighting up to announce their arrival. It's one part of the VIP treatment they'll get today, from plowing through the deep pile carpet to plowing through the smoked salmon for lunch. We prepared some agendas of today's activities so you can get an idea what's in store for you. Their custom is worth a lot of money. An order might run from thousands to millions of dollars. Like most American companies, this corporation has an image to project both to its customers and to its own staff. And this electronic message, like many things these customers will see today, comes to them courtesy of computers. In a world that demands new technologies and services almost daily, there is one thing of which you must be sure quality and you can be sure if it's Westinghouse almost since the day George Westinghouse began his crusade for alternating current Westinghouse has used technology to make the world work better through the generation transmission and distribution of electricity behind the scenes a bank of slide projectors and a projection video screen provide this complex audiovisual display in construction they're controlled by a microcomputer which sequences the slide changes, the room lights, the videotape and audio in all their split-second changes. If you're a multi-billion dollar corporation like Westinghouse, but you're fourth in office systems furniture sales, well, that's bound to be a little galling. So what you do is you up the ante when you sell to people. You show off the rest of your pedigree, which is high technology, and you show it off with a vengeance, like this entire conference center. It's a multimedia environment with projection video, Movies, slides, 37 different speakers, total control of all the lights, 33 workstations on this giant rotating platform, and a podium from which it can all be controlled. I think this room is marvelous. Let me show you. Now, this podium, which goes up if you wanted to, match your height, is the control center for the room. All the lights, all the screens, everything, all the projection. But it doesn't control it directly. It's linked through a data line to a mainframe computer in the AV section which is then linked by data line through the podium to the room, and that's what controls everything. If you don't want to control it from the podium, if you'd like to walk around, you can also control it from a handheld unit, or several handheld units, actually. It takes four to cover all the controls in the room. Or you can have the computer itself run an entire show, doing things like this, if you want. But funny as that last bit was, it's important to remember that this room was designed with a serious purpose in mind, not just impressing Westinghouse's customers, but also impressing Westinghouse's employees. Each of these workstations is arranged for a kind of maximal efficiency in a seminar. There's a smoke exhaust, so if you're a smoker, you won't bother your neighbors. There's a light you can flash to indicate to the speaker that you want to ask him a question. You have your own work light, and of course you have electrical outlets, data terminal connections, and phone connections. This is what the company makes, office partitions and office furniture. So why has it spent $15 million on building a kind of industrial Disneyland? Tom Rosewall is in charge of marketing. Westinghouse is a company that uh, is known as a big corporation, very technologically oriented. And it's able to develop relationships with some companies that are in the forefront of computer technology, understanding where they're going. And I think it boils down to a, a major series of investments. We make investments in our product uh, trying to incorporate that technology. We make investments in our facility because in many ways this facility is a living laboratory uh, for testing both our products and the computer related products as they integrate into our own. If you will please step this way. We're going to be taking you on a tour of our facility here on this computer controlled vehicle. 
This vehicle is completely computer controlled by this computer right here and it follows a frequency generating wire within the floor in order to guide it through our factory. In view of Westinghouse's position in the transport business, it's not surprising to find this prototype vehicle being tried out. What you're looking at is one of the largest space frame structures in the United States today. The people mover, as they call it, has to follow a very precise path and has a number of sensors on board to help avoid bumping into things or, more important, into people. It takes the customers on a tour not only of the factory, but also of the sales and marketing offices. This is where we do the life cycle testing of the product. Here you see the robot literally opening and closing these doors, these doors to these lateral files. What this does is test the life cycle, how long the product lasts. It's difficult to know what will wear out first, the robot or the furniture. Westinghouse makes robots, so they've got to be on show, even though this one is Japanese. Everything so far is designed to create a space age image. It's been polished steel, polished glass, and polished technology all the way. But this is the part of the tour where shop window gives way to the reality of the shop floor. And even this is polished. Workers take as little notice of the people mover as they do of the robot mailman, which follows a fluorescent strip painted on the floor. Visitors are a constant part of life in the factory, but by taking them around in this way, they cause the minimum interference with the work being done there. But now, it's time for another video. Because the shop floor is so noisy, an infrared beam transmits the audio track of each presentation into a sensor on the vehicle and enables loudspeakers to play the soundtrack on board the people mover itself. In a spirit of good industrial relations, this presentation was recorded by an employee, not an actor. Our area begins here where the 16-gauge steel frame material arise from our own roll form line. We use semi-automatic equipment like this MIG welder to position and weld the frame pieces into an extremely strong frame. Most of the work on the shop floor is surprisingly unautomated. This is the technology of the hammer and the Stanley knife. Westinghouse owns the Unimation Robotics Company, and yet there are very few robots here. This is reality, and with the present state of the art, the high-tech solution is not always the right solution. We've had quite a few of the Westinghouse people from Unimation in the plant do a survey. We've got the, the good applications we're already using with the robots, we are studying others, and we do have plans for additional robots or material handling devices that are very similar to robots. It's not so easy to work them into the workplace, is it? Well, especially in our application, because our parts are large and heavy. We need big robots in order to handle them. I think integrating is, is a big part of it, because a, a robot, per se, like in this machine here, the robots work well, the computers work well, and when you gel it all together with the automation, trying to get it all going in the same direction at the same time, that's what's difficult. I think this one's given you a lot of trouble so far. Well, this has probably been the least successful of any of the pieces of equipment we've put in so far. And this was the very job they were trying to automate. Today, it's gone back to being done by hand. We do appreciate you coming today and uh, spending some time with Wes. After the grand tour and a grand lunch, the serious business of negotiation. And of course, the environment has to be right for this, too. One of the main points about these sales meetings is to avoid distractions. But people do have to be reached, so if a phone call or a message comes in... Westinghouse Message Center. This is Tracy. Can I help you? Okay, I'll get a message to her. That person's name and badge number is flashed on the display. If they look up and see their badge number, they can then come over to this silent printer, read their message, and act on it if they feel like it through the phone system. This panel also serves as a control for the entire room's lights, projection facilities, and so forth, and it has a couple of extra goods. The environmental temperature indicator, a thermometer to those of us who aren't into jargon, and something called a data acquisition time improvement monitor, which is a fancy way of finding out what your meetings actually cost. And so the cost ticks away each minute on a screen. But what do all these fancy devices accomplish? 
Well, boy, that's a tough question to answer. <laughs> what does it accomplish? Um, it provides us the opportunity to try new technologies and see how they fit in the office. We're in the business of designing furniture, building furniture to fit into offices. Unfortunately, we also have to accommodate electronics and all of the other products that fit into your office environment, the, the file folders and everything else. We need to try virtually all of the technologies that are available, both cabling, like a local area network that we've got in place that you haven't even seen, to try the new high-tech data transfer methods, the electronic mails, the visual communications methods. Will they work? Don't they work? If not, why? Do they improve productivity in our office? Yes or no? When we can define or come up with a reasonable answer to that question for ourselves, it gives us a much stronger base to sell our product from. You put together a number of uh, typical workstations and would hope that you can consider them. Um, what you see in these workstations, of course, is a composite of our panel system and some of the components that go with it, work services, cabinetry, shelves, seating. And if we can get your agreement on them, we'd like to pre-book them today. An important part of clinching a sale is to be able to visualize what the customer wants. This is the CAD room here at Westinghouse. CAD means computer-aided design, but you don't start with a computer. When you buy systems furniture from Westinghouse, you start with a questionnaire. If you fill that out honestly, they know the kinds of things you're really going to need in your office, and then Westinghouse works together with your designer to come up with a two-dimensional and then three-dimensional plan that uses the space most efficiently. That's when you come here and, using the computer, finalize your selections. So this is where we're seeing a, a three-dimensional mock-up of uh, one of the workstations I've, I've by right. the client have selected. Right. Based on the results of the questionnaire, uh, our system has selected this typical workstation for you. Uh, one of the things we can do is change the color. Uh, we can make changes to it. These three-dimensional computer models can be endlessly changed until the customer is satisfied. Once the three-dimensional plan has been agreed, the system automatically comes up with a complete list of the parts needed to make your furniture. And it then produces a direct order which goes into the mainframe computer which keeps track of what's happening on the shop floor. Uh, as you said, it comes from the CAD system. It's entered in as a bill of material onto the mainframe. From that point, it dynamically creates a scheduled production and shipping date. We know within 10 minutes to two hours on an order that's been entered, when we anticipate shipping it and when we anticipate manufacturing it. So what we have here is computer-managed manufacturing with every order tracked through the factory using specially printed barcodes. It's this tight control of the flow of goods and materials that produces more productivity than any amount of robotics could. But there's no doubt that as the technology improves, more and more of this process will become automated. Do you think your customers really do respond to the kind of stroke that goes on when they come in here to see your products? Yes, they do. And even if they didn't, we'd have, we would have to comply with that image anyway when your primary competitors do the very same thing. We're not in this for the fun of it. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, we manufacture furniture, but we sell office environments. And I think that people in our industry and the facility that they're housed in has to epitomize what their industry is all about. When all the offices in the world are as advanced as this one, what do you do for a show then? Mm, something better. Fref reporting on the American way of selling. Well, that's about it for this week. But if you'd like a chance to win this computer music setup, then watch Saturday Supersaw tomorrow morning. That's unless you're watching the Micro Live repeat, in which case you've missed it. Next Friday, Mac will be looking at the IBM's impact on the personal computer industry in a special report called Big Blue and the Forty Dwarves. So, until 7 o'clock next week, it's good night, good night. from us. <laughs>